following program is transcribed. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. During the past few days, in every city, town, and county, representatives of the Equitable Life Assurance Society have been sending postcards to people in their neighborhood. The purpose of these postcards from Equitable Society representatives was to urge their neighbors to listen to the main commercial in tonight's Equitable broadcast. It's addressed to men and women who want to be self-supporting and independent after they're 60 years old. If that's the way you feel you'll be interested in the Independent 60s plan worked out by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. I'll give full details in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Three-Way Frame-Up. Crime in the United States is an established business, and unfortunately, that business is very good. You read a note in your newspaper about a robbery or a holdup, or you hear about one on your favorite radio news program, and you are likely to forget it quickly because few holdups are dramatic enough to impress themselves upon you. But do not be under the mistaken belief that those thefts are isolated and the result of any accident. The majority of them are well planned, and more than that, Many of them are the result of work by groups of tightly knit gangs. That those gangs enjoyed a banner year in the past 12 months is shown by the figures recently gathered by your FBI in a nationwide survey into the field of crime. The value of property stolen last year in the United States totaled more than $113 million, or an average of $2.5 million a week. That figure should impress you law-abiding citizens because that $113 million was your money. Tonight's file opens in the lavishly furnished apartment of Alice and George Hopkins. It is mid-afternoon, and George has just come in. George? Yeah? What are you doing home so early? I don't feel well. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. Can I get you something? No, I don't want anything. What's the matter? I just wanted to see Dr. Elliot. He, uh, he examined me with a fluoroscope. What's that? Well, it's, uh, it's like an X-ray machine, only you get the pictures right there without waiting. What did he say? I've got an ulcer. You've got it? I've got to take it easy. Oh, George, that's awful. Well, I don't like to be an I told you so, but I've been telling you right along you've been working too hard. I know, and you've told me to take it easy. But how can I? I run a one-man business. The cemeteries are full of people who ran a one-man business. What else did the doctor say? Oh, I've got to give up work for a while. Go away. Well, George, that's wonderful. You haven't had a vacation in years. I know, but I don't think I should take one. Why not? Well, who will run my business? Oh, now, George. No, I mean it. Well, there must be somebody to take over while you're gone. Who? Who can I trust? Well, h- how about Bob Nelson? Well, I, I, I thought of him. And? I'm not sure he's had enough experience. But George, he's been with you a long time. Alice, Alice, you must realize that length of service is no barometer for talent. But he's very clever at stealing things. You told me that. There's a great deal of difference between being a thief and a fence. My business is receiving stolen goods. But he's been helping you. I know. Well, then why don't you give him a chance? Oh, now, look, honey, well, I... I'm only suggesting it so that you can get away. I realize that, but... Oh, now, look, look, this isn't good for my ulcer. Get, get me some water. I gotta take some pills. We'll talk this over later. Who is it? Oh. 
Hi, baby. Hi. Got any whiskey in the house? Sure. And mix us some drinks. We got something to celebrate. What? George saw a doctor this afternoon. He's sick. No kid. Yeah. The doc says he's got to go away. Is he going? Yeah. Is that what we're celebrating? No. This drink will be to you. I don't get it. You're the new head man. Huh? George had to get somebody to run the business while he's gone. I sold him on you. Well, thanks, baby. Yeah. He's going to call you later. What's the matter with him? Oh, he claims he's got an ulcer, but you know the way he belly aches all the time. He won't be happy till they name a new disease after him. How long is he going to be gone? Six months. That should give you all the time you need. For what? To take his business over permanently. Oh. Would you drink to that? Sure, baby. There's only one thing to remember. What? I go with the job. You think I'd want to forget that? No. How about another drink? Not now. I've got to hurry back to the house. After all, I'm George's ever-loving, dutiful wife until he leaves town. Come in. It's open. Hello, doll. Oh, Bob, honey. I didn't expect you here tonight, sugar. Honey, I just came by to tell you that you get ready to move out of this crumb hotel. Why? George Hopkins got sick, and he's got to get out of town. Well, how does that make me move out of here? I'm going to take over his business while he's gone. Oh. Don't you realize what that means, honey? All those things I promised you, you can have every one of them. Even the mink coat? Two mink coats. One for when it rains. Oh, well, that's wonderful, Bob. Hey, I thought you and George didn't get along too good. Uh, he didn't pick me for the job. His wife did. Oh? Well, now, don't get mad, honey. She don't mean anything to me. Well, why did she pick you then? She stuck on me. Oh, Bob. Well, look, I can't help it. Well, you must have encouraged her. I didn't, honey, honest. But we'll have to be careful for a little while. Where we go together and, and, and things like that. Why? Because she thinks I'm stuck on her. That I'm going to cut up the business with her as soon as George leaves town. But as soon as I take over, baby. It's just you and me. <laughs> The next morning at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just greeting Agent Ike Woodford. Hello, Ike. Hey, when did you get back? Just this morning, Jim. You're a great guy. Hey, must have been a good vacation. Oh, it was wonderful. Plenty of sunshine, plenty of fishing. Hey, what'd you catch? Speckled trout. Huh? Now, I know this is an old cliche, Jim, but one got away that must have weighed at least... Ike, I'll bet it wasn't as heavy as this case you've been assigned to. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> what is the case, Jim? Hijacking. Nothing's changed much since I left. I think maybe we got a break on this case, though. Well, that's good. We found one of the trucks out on Highway 37. Abandoned? Yeah. Nothing new about that, Jim. We found trucks before. But this one was still loaded. Stolen goods. Uh Oh? Truck hit a soft shoulder on the road, ran off into a ditch. I see. It was filled with about $11,000 worth of stolen drugs and headed for here. Well, how do you know that, Jim? We found a note in the cab of the truck saying that the shipment was due to be delivered to the warehouse here. No other address on the note, huh? No. Police over at Madison are checking up on the truck now. Well, the driver just took off, I assume. That's right. I got to thinking about it, though, after I saw the truck, and I figured that maybe he was injured when he went off the road. So I checked with all the hospitals around Madison. Sure enough, the guy came in with a dislocated shoulder to be treated. Did they have his name? Well, they had a name, but it wasn't the right one. He also gave him a phony address. I see. That's why I said we may have one break, though. The man who was treated for the dislocated shoulder left his shirt and undershirt at the hospital after they put on the cast. Well, let's hope we can get something from the laundry marks. The lab is working on that now, Ike. As soon as they give us the word, we'll start moving. Alice, get me a glass of water, will you? Are you going to take some more of those pills? So quick? My stomach is killing me. What time is it? Ten after ten. Oh, where is Bob Nelson? He should have been here ten minutes ago. Oh, I didn't know you called him. Here. Oh, thanks. 
I don't know what's what's in that medicine, but it, it sure helps. Maybe you better get an extra box for while you're gone. Oh, I've already ordered a whole case. Good. Hey, hey. Oh, that must be Nelson now. Uh, go let him in, will you? Okay. Hello, Mrs. Hopkins. Please come in. Oh, thank you. Hello, Nelson. Hello, George. Sorry to hear about your health. Yeah, it's awful, just awful. The doctor told me this is the worst ulcer he's seen in 35 years of practice. Well, you better take care of it, George. No, I'm going to. I'm leaving town in an hour. Hey, go, go sit down and let's get right down to business, huh? Can I get anything for you, Mr. Nelson? Yeah, no, thanks. Hey, you better sit down, too, Alice. All right, all right. Now, uh, this, uh, this list here, Bob, uh, this is our list of contacts. They all ship stuff to the warehouse. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Now, this, uh, this list here, yeah, this... These are the people who get rid of the stuff for you, depending on what kind of stuff it is. I see. And here, um, yeah, here's the lease on the warehouse. It's made out in the name of the ABC Corporation. Well, that's you. No, no, that's you. It's whoever runs the warehouse. There is no ABC Corporation, really. Oh, I get it. The name's marked with the stars on that second sheet, Mr. Nelson. That means they can only be contacted at night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot to tell you that. They're supposed to be legitimate people, so don't bother them during the day. Okay. Uh, what else? I'll be back here in six months, Bob. Just see that nobody gets out of line with you. If you do that, the place will run itself. No, I'll be tough. Don't oh, worry. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you get stuck on anything, just uh, just ask Alice. <laughs> she knows as much about the business as I do. Fine. Thanks. Then after a few weeks, when she's sure you got everything running smooth, she's uh, she's going to come out and, uh, and join me. Uh, you won't mind if I come for you for some advice from time to time, will you, Ms. Hutt? No, no, not at all. In fact, I'd like you to call on me. That way I'll be sure to protect George's interests. Ike, any word from the police? No, not yet, Jim. They checked that laundry over an hour ago, and it was the right place. That's good. Maybe they've set up a surveillance at the driver's house. Probably. Well, there's nothing any of us can do now but wait until he comes home. I hope they get more from him than I got from the owner of that truck. Oh, I didn't know you saw him. Oh, that's that's right. You were in with the boss when that call came in from Madison Police. I thought that was a stolen truck, Jim. Yeah, so did I, but it wasn't. Well, I wonder why the driver took the trouble to remove the license plates then. Oh, he must have forgotten in his panic that we could check the motor and serial numbers. At any rate, the owner turned out to be a man named Joe Spencer. Mm, never heard of him. Well, he's not a local. He's from over in Madison. Police had no trouble in picking him up. Did he admit owning the truck? Yes, but he claims he had no idea what was in it. He says he only uses the truck during the day and that his driver must have loaded it with the stolen drugs. <laughs> That's a likely story. He made it even more implausible by saying that he had just hired the driver. Didn't even have his name or address on record. Well, he certainly sounds like he's mixed up in this thing. Oh, up to his ears. Jim. Oh, yes, Carl. This teletype just came in from police headquarters for you. Oh, well. Thanks, Carl. Is uh, that about the driver? Yeah, his name is Eddie Leslie, Ike. Hey, he's told the police his whole story. Including the location of the warehouse here in town? Yes, it's at 989 Franklin Avenue. The police are on their way there now. I'd better go over there and meet them. Just a minute. Bob. Out of the way, you... Alice. Bob, what's the matter with you? What did you take me for? A square, a chump, an out-of-the-town Elmer? You know I've got a good mind to... Wait a minute, wait a minute. What's this all about? Great little deal you had at me. What are you talking about? I just went by the warehouse. The joint is crawling with cops. What? They're all over the place. And every one of them is looking for me. Bob. Uh, You and that husband of yours tried to frame me, didn't you? Thought I'd take the rap of your phony deal. Oh, Bob, why would I frame you? I made George go away so we could be together. Ah, oh, don't give me that. Well, it's the truth. I swear it is. Well, then George framed both of us. What do you mean? Take a look at this note. I just picked it up in my apartment. Who's it from? My girl, Helen. You've got a girl? I did have a girl. She's just run away with your husband, George. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI helps promote national security. Now let's talk briefly about another kind of security. Security for men and women who want to look forward to independent 60s. Uh, what do you mean, independent 60s? It means that you're not accepting one cent of charity after you're 60 years old. You don't have to live in someone else's house. You're still enjoying life. 
To one man, Independent 60s means a home of his own in the country. Yes, eggs from your own chickens, fruit from your own orchard, vegetables from your own garden. Or, to another man, Independent 60s means travel, going south for the winter. But whatever Independent 60s means to you, the thing to do is to stop wishing and hoping for it and start doing something about it right now. Start by investigating the Independent 60s plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Well, sounds fine if a man can afford it. But what am I going to use for money? Well, if that's all that's holding you back, Tom, then your Equitable Society representative has a very pleasant surprise for you. He'll work out an Independent 60s plan that's geared to your present income. Actually, if you're between the ages of 30 and 45 and covered by Social Security you'll be amazed how little this equitable plan costs, considering how much it does for you. At any rate, it costs absolutely nothing to find out. Your Equitable Society representative will give you the facts and figures on the Equitable Independent 60s plan. Get in touch with him soon, or write care of this station to the home office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to tonight's file, The Three-Way Frame-Up. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI graphically illustrates one important point, and that is that in the mind of the typical criminal, loyalty is a word which means being friendly with the winner. Past friendships, marital ties, alleged love... None of those count for anything in the torturously warped brain of anyone who tries to make his livelihood outside the law. The files of every large law enforcement agency, like your FBI, is liberally studded with cases in which brother has turned on brother, in which child has turned on parent. The only things which govern a criminal's behavior are what's in it for me and who can I frame. As Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, has pointed out, One of the reasons for the present-day high crime rates is the failure on the part of too many citizens to assume the responsibilities of citizenship. Part of your job as a citizen is to see to it that your local police department is well enough manned and financed so that it can do the job it wants to do, so that it can help drive the criminal out of business. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. You look disappointed, Jim. I am. I thought we were going to close this case when we located that warehouse. Did you find anything there? No, when we got there, the place was empty. Doesn't sound like the truck driver told the truth. No, I think he's leveling with us, Ike. Oh, but it doesn't make sense that a drop as big as that one could be empty at any time. Not unless somebody just emptied it. (laughs) Well, the only reason for doing that would be because the owner knew we were on his trail. Maybe he did. Oh, maybe he guessed that his driver would talk. I checked at the Hall of Records on the place, Jim, and that's not much help either. Who's on record as being the owner of the place? An outfit named the ABC Corporation is the lessee of the property, Mm -hmm. and the lease is signed by a G.E. Robertson as president. Have you contacted Robertson? There is no such person. It's a fake name. Another one, huh? Well, maybe the watchman was right. He told me a man named Bob Nelson had been there earlier and said that he was the new boss. I know that name, Jim. Yeah, so do I. I'm having the records section send us everything they've got on him. Maybe we can get a lead from that. The owner of the property that the warehouse stands on is the Don Allen Company. Don Allen Company? They're a legitimate outfit. How did they get mixed up with this? I don't know. Neither did they. They said that they were paid rent every month by the ABC Corporation and never investigated what was going on at the warehouse. It's too bad. If they had, maybe we could have broken this ring a lot sooner. Jim? Oh, yes, Carl. What is it? From the record section. Oh, thanks, Carl. Let's hope this is it. Mm Mm-hmm. It looks like Bob Nelson has a pretty long record. Yeah, he sure has. Hey, Ike, mm-hmm. take a look at this. Uh, right there. Uh, there's an arrest for selling stolen goods. Sounds like he could be our man. Let's send out an alarm on Nelson right away. <laughs> Yes, Helen. Ain't you coming in the pool again, sugar? No, I've had enough of the day, honey. This oh. uh, this desert air starts to get chilly. All right. Well, I'll come out too then. Oh, I'll give you a hand. Oh, oh thanks. Whew. 
Ah, drive me off, will you? Oh, sure. Ah, I wonder what time it is. Oh, it's five... Tw- hey. What? You forgot to remind me to take my pills. No, I didn't. Well, where are they? I haven't got them. Well, did you leave them in the cottage? No, I threw them away. Threw them away? Yes, I got sick and tired of playing second fiddle to an ulcer. Oh, but Helen, I... You brought me here for a vacation, sugar, not a rest cure. But I need those pills. Oh, Georgie, that's just your imagination. If you take pills, you think you're sick. If you think you're sick, we don't go out. We came to the desert to have fun. Honey, we've been having fun. We swim every day. You go shopping for clothes. You... No, well, I want nighttime fun. I want to ride out in the desert, visit the sheik. <laughs> honey, want... honey, there are no sheiks in Arizona. Well, then take me dancing. Aren't there places for that? All right, honey. We'll go dancing tonight. <laughs> Jim, yeah? uh, we've got Bob Nelson and the watchman from that warehouse outside. Oh, good. Ike, will you send Nelson in, please? Right. Oh, and Ike, while I'm interviewing him, why don't you see what you can find out from the watchman? Then we can compare stories later on, okay. huh? Okay. All right, Nelson, this way. Here he is, Jim. Thanks, Ike. Sit down, Nelson. Okay. I'm telling you right now, you guys have got nothing on me. That remains to be seen. I'd like to ask you a few questions, Nelson. Go ahead, ask me anything. Why did you tell the watchman at the warehouse that you were the new boss? I didn't tell him that. I told him I was running things while the boss was away. You were working for somebody else? That's right. Who? George Hopkins. If you ask me where he is, I'll tell you. I don't know. He said he was sick, had to go away. So he went away with my girl. Was he sick? I don't think so. But he was always used to make out he was dying. He had pills to take care of everything. How about that list of contacts the police found in your hotel? Hopkins gave them to me. They're even in his handwriting. Then you knew the warehouse was a drop. Sure, I knew it. I ain't claiming I'm a lily. But you guys got no rap on me because I never operated the warehouse. Ask the watchman if you don't believe me. I will. I... Yes, Jim? Did you ask the watchman how long Nelson had been running a place? Yes, I did. He said he never actually ran it, that we moved in before he had a chance. There, you see? Did the watchman know where Hopkins had gone? No. No, he didn't, Jim. Mm. Maybe you can find out from his wife. No? Where is she? We've got an apartment at 108 West Owens Avenue. Okay. All right, Nelson. We're going to hold you for further questioning. How long? Until we can locate the commissioner and arraign you. In the meantime, Mike, let's get a warrant. Go over and talk to Mrs. Hopkins. Nothing in this closet. Certainly emptied every room thoroughly. Yeah, they sure did. I wonder how Ms. Hopkins found out where her husband was. I don't know. All she told him down at the desk is that she was going to visit him. Maybe she was running away. Yeah, could be. She left this morning, huh? Well, that's what they said. They said she seemed to be in a big hurry, too. Yeah. I guess maybe we better get back to the office, Jim, and just chalk this visit off as a loss. Yeah, looks that way. What do you got there? Hmm? Oh. These are some health pamphlets I found on the desk over there. Hmm? Listen to this, will you? You can be healthy at 90. Hmm. Life begins at 55, too. And, uh, oh, listen to this one. Bad eaters die young. <laughs> he sounds like a worse hypochondriac than we thought he was. Oh, he certainly does. He sounds like the kind of a... Mike, hmm? hey, that might be the answer. What's that? Well, we know he's a hypochondriac, which means he must have a nice, large collection of pills and medicines. That's right. All right, where do you buy pills and medicines? In a drugstore. Right, come on, let's check every drugstore in this neighborhood. Gee, Georgie... Sugar, you're a wonderful dancer. Oh, uh, thanks. Now, aren't you glad you did this? Yeah. You know, I bet you forgot all about your ulcer, too. Well, Helen, to tell you the truth... May I, I cut in? Huh? Alice. What's the matter? Aren't you glad to see your own wife? Helen, why did you throw away those pills? What are you doing here? How did you know where he was? I called his tailor. I knew he couldn't go anywhere without letting him know where to send his clothes. Aren't you ashamed of yourself, young lady, running off with my husband? Oh, stop with that stuff. What about you and Bob Nelson? I got the whole rundown on that one. We're all finished. So are we. Oh, no, we're not. 
I want $25,000 or I go to the cops. Shh, people are looking. I don't care. Besides, it's impolite to discuss money matters in public. Alice, Alice, walk around the floor to our table, huh? We'll dance over to meet you. Wow. Well, all right. Come on, Helen. Sugar, you're not really going to give her $25,000, are you? Of course not. Well, then why did you... I'm gonna, gonna have her come down to the cottage with us. When we get her there, we'll, uh... We'll lock her in the closet and blow. Oh, but what you... quiet. Well, what do we do now? We'll go down to our cottage and talk, Alice. First, though, I've got to pay our check. Waiter! Oh, waiter! Better call for huh? a lawyer, too, Mr. Hopkins. Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. I've got a warrant here for the arrest of all three of you. George, I guess I shouldn't have thrown away those pills. <laughs> George Hopkins received a 20-year sentence for theft from an interstate shipment. Robert Nelson was sentenced to 10 years and the two women to five years each under the same statute. The clue which led your FBI to George Hopkins came after a check of the drugstores in Hopkins' neighborhood. One of them revealed that he had just ordered a refill on several prescriptions written by a Dr. Elliot. Locating the doctor was a simple matter... And since every hypochondriac notifies his doctor of his every move, the two special agents were able to find out where Hopkins had gone. A quick trip to the resort brought the results you have already seen, the arrest and subsequent conviction of all the criminals involved. When your FBI closes a file like this, a file that has been a major irritant for some time, there is the very human temptation to relax and to enjoy the fruits of victory. But every special agent has been trained to realize that relaxation is not a part of law enforcement. Stop fighting crime for one day, and the crime wave will wash away the hard-won victories of a month. It may be true that there is no rest for the weary, but it is even truer that there is no rest for the members of your FBI, special agents who have learned that the price of successful law enforcement is the same as the price of liberty, eternal vigilance. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's case from the files of your FBI. Now three final questions on the Equitable Society's Independent 60s plan. Uh, Mr. Keating, I'm 28 years old. Is that too young to start one of these plans? Your equitable representative will tell you that the sooner you start, the less the plan will cost you each year. Yeah, but what about the life insurance I already have? Your equitable representative will show you how to integrate it into your plan. Well, what income will it give me in my 60s? Your equitable society representative will give you the exact figure. Either get in touch with him soon or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A telling story that underlines the nation's number one law enforcement problem. Its subject, juvenile delinquency. Its title, The Remorseful Runaway. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Remorseful Runaway on This Is Your FBI. The hungry people of Europe must be fed. You can help feed them. Send $10 to CARE, C-A-R-E, New York. Do it today. This program was transcribed. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.